I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Stansberry Radio Network. This is James Altucher at a very special James Altucher Show. I have with me Ariana Huffington editor-in-chief of the Huffington Post. Hello, Ariana. How are you doing? Great to be with you, James. Thank you. And, Ariana, I'm really psyched that your book, Thrive, is number one on the New York Times bestseller list this week. Are you, does that something that, like, do you feel like your uh, uh, item on your bucket list has been ticked off? <laughs> no, what I feel is that um, it's an indication of the global shift that's happening, that people are really experiencing this collective longing to stop living in the shallows, to stop destroying our lives through burnout and exhaustion and pursuing um, success the way the world has defined it, which has not worked really for millions of people. Not, not only has it not worked, but I feel the, the uncertainty, the economic uncertainty in the world has only increased, particularly since 2008. So many people have lost their jobs or become underemployed, that there's so much more stress in the world right now. Yes, absolutely. And, and also, there's so much more stress because of the way we have identified success, success just with money and power. And, um, and a lot of people are missing out on their lives or even just defining ourselves and who we are with our jobs and uh, um, and we see you know the impact this has we see how many people are depressed addicted and um, dealing with um, a lot of the diseases that come with stress like diabetes or high blood pressure or heart disease so we're looking at all these casualties and I think there's been a collective enough I, and I that's what I, I'm experiencing going around the country and talking to people I agree. And, you know, of course, the elephant in the room here is that you're incredibly successful in the traditional way that people define success. And I'll just say the traditional yeah. way that people define success is by money and career. And throughout your life, you've been very successful. But I, I want to read the very first line of your book. And it's, it's funny because I often give people advice when they ask me about writing. I often people give people the advice they should uh, bleed in the first line. And I only mean it metaphorically, <laughs> but you actually do bleed in the first line. So I'm going to read it right now. 
You start off, on the morning of April 6, 2007, I was lying on the floor of my home office in a pool of blood. That's, I'm, I'm laughing, you know, even though you were in a pool of blood, but that's a great first line. How can you not continue after that line? I have to find out why Ariana Huffington was lying in a pool of her own blood. So what happened? How did you end up there? So what happened is that it was two years um, after we launched the Huffington Post. Um, I was working 18-hour days. I had two daughters, one of whom was going through uh, a college tour with me to, de to decide what colleges she wanted to apply to. And I returned home completely exhausted. And um, I fainted, hit my head on my desk, broke my cheekbone, got four stitches on my right eye. And as I came to in the pool of my own blood, I started asking myself these questions. Is this really what success is? Uh, because um, by conventional definitions of success, as you said, I was successful. But by any sane definition of success, if you are lying in a pool of blood on the floor of your office, you are not successful. I would agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so, it and, seems like as you were coming out of this, you you you're, you sort of redefined what success was, and as you call it in the book, you call it the you you decided to go for the third metric, which you define as pursuing you know well being, uh, wisdom, uh, wonder, and giving. So, uh, well being, I, I I agree with you very much on all four of these factors. I think I think these are all four things that people greatly ignore. But there's one thing in well being that you that you you give scientific research and it's very interesting about sleeping. I think people think that they're superstars if they only if they can get away with four or five hours of sleep a night and then be super productive. But I myself sleep nine or ten hours a night. Like I love to sleep. And it was so refreshing to see that in your in your book. So what's what's the story with sleep? And do you sleep more now than you did then? Well first of all, I'm very impressed. You're definitely a pioneer. And I um, am. and I, I love it especially here. because you're a man and you're young and you're an entrepreneur and you are saying that how much you are sleeping, which is actually very much what star athletes are also saying. Because what is interesting is that athletes are ahead of business people um, when it comes to recognizing the importance of introducing renewal and regeneration into our daily life. So I went from four to five hours to seven to eight hours. And that was like the one big habit that I changed first. Now, I didn't go immediately from four to five to seven to eight. That's why in the book, I recommend small baby steps. You know, I start, as you know, at the end of each section, I have three little steps, three little changes we can make in our lives that will be transformational, instead of immediately assuming we're going to change everything all at once, which isn't going to work, right? Right. I so, think, I think um, people need that I, kind of I tiny recommend, habits approach. You know, adding 30 minutes of sleep to your day, just 30 minutes. Everybody can do that. It will mean saying no to some things. It will mean not watching John Stewart. You can DVR it. Um, and you, the benefit that we get waking up feeling so much more uh, alert and able to face whatever life brings us. And, and what is amazing is that the, the science now is incontrovertible. That's why this is such an exciting moment, uh, because we have the scientific evidence to back up the ancient wisdom that we've known about. And we now have science that shows that uh, sleep is like a dishwasher. It cleans up the accumulated waste of the day between our brain cells, and it increases mental clarity, and it and it um, prevents Alzheimer's. You know, all it's like a miracle drug. <laughs> it, it really is. You, you mentioned a miracle drug, but it does actually release endorphins into the body, which helps you have more energy, helps you to be happier. Uh, you know, as you point out, uh, the only the only benefit of not sleeping is uh, it induces so-called magical thinking, uh, which is not necessarily a good thing. Like, it, sleep helps in every other area of life. Yes, if you want to be a fortune teller, perhaps don't sleep. <laughs> well, okay, another one that I'm really interested in is wonder. 
like I think so many people get involved in their daily routine that that the anxieties that are sort of buried into each step of that routine start to build up. They 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 lose that sense of wonder in life because they never make any changes to that routine. Like how do you capture a sense of wonder in your life right now? And you have, you know, such a so many interesting things you do, I'm sure. How do you find the sense of wonder in it all? So for me the the key thing has been to stop multitasking. And I speak as somebody who was like um, an obsessive multitasker. I really believed that that was the way for me to be most productive. So uh, until I made these changes in my life, I really could not, cannot remember of a time when I would say, um, get dressed or put my makeup on or take it off and not be on the phone to someone in my office or someone in my business that I was working with. And now that I'm actually just present doing what I'm doing, A, it's eliminated a lot of stress because, again, scientific evidence, multitasking is an incredibly stressful thing and it doesn't work. It's actually task switching. So learning all that has been has made a big difference in my life, and it's, it's brought joy into my life. And that's something which I want to do as I go around the country speaking about Thrive and the message. You know, one of the things I want to do is to bring joy back into our daily lives because it's almost as though we've told ourselves that we, can, we are going to be effective and productive and, hey, you know, we'll be joyful over the weekend or when we retire or when we go on vacation. Mm-hmm. And... Then we miss life and we miss the moment as my mother, who is, to whom the book is dedicated, who lived a third metric life before I knew what it was, as she would say to my sister and me, don't miss the moment. Well, you know, and it's, it's so what, as you started applying this, were you doing this while you were still at or, or before the Huffington Post got sold? Did you find yourself get more productive and the Huffington Post get more successful as you were starting to apply this in your life? Absolutely. I mean, I can I can point out directly the decisions I made um, that were because I was clearer, I was more connected to my own intuition and wisdom, I was better at seeing red flags, not hiring the wrong people. Um, it was dramatically different. What, what's like a specific... Uh, Thing that happened that you noticed Let me is directly just give you related one to this example, change. which is that the Huffington Post now um, is in 11 countries. Um, three years ago, we were just in the United States. I was very clear that we had to become global. And I came up with this idea of doing it as partnerships in order to be able to move fast. Um, so all our international expansion is as commercial partnerships or JVs with a major media partner, like in France, Le Monde, in Spain, El Pais, in uh, uh, Japan, the Asahi Shimbun Company. So this was a simple idea that has meant that we can grow very fast um, without a very large investment and um, and be a global media company with journalists all around the world, which are these this, um, international editions are also acting like international bureaus for our international coverage. And out of our 95 million UVs, which is where we are right now, 44% are outside the United States. Hmm. So and that, you, that's you one this, idea, uh, basically. Uh, kind of having this newer intuition or better intuition that, that developed. Yes, exactly. And, uh, and, you know, because I think for me leadership is about two things. One is seeing the icebergs before they hit the Titanic. And the other is um, seeing the opportunities. And uh, I think in both, in both cases I have been more effective than ever before. I think um, the teams that we have here at the Huffington Post, including my leadership team, um, are actually practicing a lot of these principles. You know, we care for each other. We make sure everybody has um, has enough time to recharge and take vacations and 
Um, we have we are very flexible with people who say want to move part time because they're dealing with something difficult at home or because they um, they are um, they just had a new baby or whatever. So all those things of flexibility, teamwork, um, treating people like human beings, not just um, not just um, resources. Um, has made a big difference in the culture of Half Post. Now, it, also in that chapter, Wonder, you talk a lot about uh, death, and it's interesting because death obviously is a is a, a huge thing people learn from because we obviously all have to face it. We're obviously all scared of it, and it's how we deal with that fear and how we deal with the deaths of the people we love and learn from it that helps us our, ourselves deal with death. But what what were you referring to when you kind of talk about death in the wonder chapter? Well, I feel that, as Socrates said, um, we need to practice death daily. Um, now, not in a morbid sense, but because, as the Onion headline put it, death rate holds steady at 100%. Right, I love that. So um, death is really what... Um, helps us put everything in in our life in perspective, and um, and I feel that when we integrate it in our lives, as the um, the Romans used to carve MM Memento Mori, remember death on their statues and trees. When we do that, um, first of all, we are more likely to tap into the mystery and the wonder of life because we connect with a part of us that is eternal, and which I believe that there is such a part, our soul. Now, if somebody doesn't believe that, you can still be what uh, Reed Hoffman, I was, I was just seeing him last Thursday when I was at LinkedIn, the, the founder of LinkedIn, and he said, he called, he said to me, I'm a mystical atheist. So I think there are a lot of people who are atheists, but at the same time, they have a sense of the mystery of the universe. They have a sense of the mystical nature of the universe. And and um, I think when we remember death, we are more likely to connect with that part of life. It, you know, it's not even mystical because as you're getting, let's say, closer to death, let's say a doctor told you, oh, you have so many months to live, you're going to start to think, oh my gosh, I've got to make sure every moment is special. And now the the scary thing is, is that most of the time, no doctor tells us that, but we have no idea when we're going to die. Every single thing you and I do today is somebody else died doing that at some point in human history. So death is always close, but we try to put it off a little bit. And I think having that appreciation that death could be always right around the corner makes us think that, okay, well, I'm not going to argue with my wife today or my kids today because I could die today. So I have to <laughs> I have to treat this as a special moment and something sacred. I love that. I think it's it's um, it, it, it's such a poignant and powerful way to live. And I have this section, as you know, in the book about our eulogies because um, – I was very struck when I was at a friend's memorial but by how our eulogies have nothing to do with our resumes because they increased market share by one-third or made senior right. vice president at 35. It's always the other things that I mentioned in our eulogies, you know, how we made people feel and what made us laugh, you know, our small kindnesses, lifelong passions, and I just... I just love to remember that because we have 30,000 um, hours to to play the game of life if we're lucky, and how we play it will depend on what we value. And and you bring and this we, up in your in the chapter wisdom that holding on to things like resentments or regrets. Like I love this one quote you have from Carrie Fisher: uh, "Resentment is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die." Like, resentment just never works out, and yet people all along, you know, every day, just, they, it's the negative chatter in their heads while they're running around their day. They, they resent this, or they're afraid of this, or they're anxious about this, but 
you know, that's not treating the moment as sacred. And they're going to end up in a weird way. They're going to end up being less successful because they're so bogged down in all of these things that won't show up in the eulogy. Like nobody will ever list your regrets in your eulogy. Um, absolutely. I think that this is a great way of putting it, that holding grudges, resentments, um, is just one of the ways in which we miss out on life. Now, that doesn't mean we're not going to get angry or not going to get upset. It's, it's the clinging to that that is uh, where the pain comes from. I, I love uh, watching children. They're kind of my role model in how to deal with life, because they get upset if you tell them they have to go to sleep or they can't have that ice cream. And then literally two minutes later, they're smiling, they're moving on to the next thing, it's, and it's as though nothing has happened. There is no remnant. Right, well, and that's... Here's, an, here's an interesting statistic about children as opposed to adults. So the average number of times a child laughs per day is 300. The average number of times an adult laughs per day is five. Somewhere between childhood and adulthood, it's almost like we've lost the ability to laugh. And laughter, just like sleeping, also releases endorphins and oxytocin and all these great brain chemicals that give us energy and happiness. That's beautiful. I'm going to use that statistic from now on. I love it. Feel free. Steal, steal <laughs> anything from me is yours. Thank you. And, and then... On the third metric as well is giving. And I think this is also something people feel like, okay, after I have a lot of money, I'm going to start giving. They don't realize how even small amounts of giving can be integrated into life. And not just money, but giving of our time or even of our thoughts. Yes, well, I think let's start with the science. Because uh, the science is amazing here. You know, we see there's a, this research that has been done at the university um, of North Carolina that shows that our genes are wired for giving. Uh, I mean, for giving, not for giving. Right. Um, by which I mean that when, we, when the happiness we experience is because we're giving to others, the inflammatory markers that are the precursors of disease go down. And when our happiness is based just on self-gratification, they go up. Now, life is, of course, a mixture of both. But it just shows the difference that giving does to our own happiness and our own health. Giving is really a shortcut to happiness. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think it's, I think it's extremely important. And it, and it makes evolutionary sense because if you think about it, who survived, what, what gene survived? It's the, it's the people who helped each other in the tribe that were able to, to then, uh, you know, mate and replicate their DNA. And the people who weren't very helpful, they were kind of just sort of left on their own and they, they probably didn't end up having children. And so evolution rewarded those who uh, developed the giving gene. Um, exactly. This makes complete evolutionary sense. And yet somehow in our culture we made giving like an afterthought, like something we do at Thanksgiving or um, or something we do over Christmas. Now, so so you, you had all of these, you started developing all these different practices, and what started happening? You, you started seeing the results in the Huffington Post. Huffington Post was growing and growing. What made you decide at one point, okay, now's the time to sell this and take it to the next step? Again, it was uh, being very clear about how fast the world of uh, media was moving. And um, I knew that if we were going to remember a leader, in the, to rem if we were going to remain a leader in the field, we needed the resources to keep growing in, in multiple areas, to keep growing in terms of our technology, um, develop our mobile and video technologies, um, expand globally, as I mentioned, and also expand um, investigative coverage, expand uh, um, coverage in these areas of how we can lead a um, healthier, more sustainable life. So in order to do all that, we needed resources. So frankly, the greatest um, incentive for selling was not the fact that we, we got a lot of money, which was great, trust me. It was the fact that we got the resources to expand in all these areas. Do you, do you feel uh, media is changing a little bit with the rise of sites like 
uh, BuzzFeed or Viral Nova or Distractify, you know, these sites that kind of appear out of nowhere and, and scrape content from everywhere just, just for the purposes of going viral as opposed to uh, more journalistic purposes? I think we're going to have a hybrid world more and more that incorporates a lot of different sites, um, that incorporates uh, both uh, sites that are um, platforms that are inviting um, the participation of, um, of people, um, whether they are writers or entrepreneurs or artists, and also I think more and more sites uh, value uh, more than ever the traditional uh, functions of journalism. Um, fact-checking, accuracy, fairness, and, and in-depth reporting. So I, I think this is going to be a golden age of journalism because it involves the participation and engagement of our readers. It's interesting because I was talking with somebody from the Associated Press, which is definitely old school traditional media, and their uh, basic approach now is they see what topics are trending in Twitter, and that's where they know where to send their reporters. Like Twitter has become such a big part of uh, not only media consumption, but media generation. Uh, I wonder how that affects uh, what articles you cover or pursue at, at the Huffington Post. You know, we at the Huffington Post, from the beginning, from day one, have had certain um, prior editorial priorities, including the fate of the middle class, uh, the fate of the unemployed. We have Arthur Delaney, a reporter dedicated to covering this um, and putting flesh and blood on the data. Uh, we've been covering the wars in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan and the impact they've had, uh, the lives of returning vets is, a, is again, um, a topic we've been covering relentlessly, and that one is our first Pulitzer, uh, the mm -hmm. failed war on drugs. So we have a lot of topics that are completely independent of what is trending, because they are topics that we believe in and that we believe um, we, we want to be putting the spotlight on. At the same time, we, we believe, and that's consistent with the message of Thrive, that we have a responsibility to put the spotlight on what is working, not just what is um, dysfunctional and corrupt. And, and I think it's, you know, it's very important because I think these are areas that are largely uncovered or undercovered in traditional media. Like, nobody quite understands what's happening to the middle class right now, but the reality is the middle class is systematically getting fired from the Fortune 500. I, I see this from various viewpoints, but essentially the Fortune 500 is globalizing, is outsourcing, is using technology to replace workers. And that's why these stress levels and this economic uncertainty is rising, even as the economic data is also rising. So it's creating this sort of uh, bilateral economy where there's very few clear winners. And I think that's why a book like yours is important because people can't look for the traditional metrics for success. They have to find different metrics that are internal to themselves. But I don't think that's, that the, that's the only reason. I think that people who can be fully successful by the first two metrics of success realize that that's not enough, that it's like a two-legged stool, that sooner or later, or, later, or later you fall off. So I think that's the most important message, that the two metrics – Wherever you are, whether you are struggling to put food on the table or um, at the top um, of the career ladder, are not a full life. They don't give us the, the sense of purpose and meaning that we want in life and the joy that we want in life. That's right. And there's a lot of studies that show that, you know, incremental increases in income, for instance, don't always have the same uh, increase in happiness, that after a certain point, increases in income don't increase happiness at all in general. And so let's say someone uh, wants to follow the ideas you describe in your book. What are the initial steps they should take or you advise they take, given that you're advising you know, small steps at first and it's, it's hard to do everything at once? So at the end of each chapter, there are three small steps. Um, for, let me just mention one 
from the end of each section. At the end of the well-being section, for example, I recommend just five minutes of meditation. Uh, beginning with this quiet time, this connection with ourselves, and um, and then allowing that to bring its own rewards that would lead us to want to spend more time with ourselves. At the end of the wisdom chapter, one of my favorite steps is at the end of each day, escort all your devices outside the bedroom and never charge your smartphones by your bed because you're going to be tempted if you wake up in the middle of the night to go to your devices to check your data and then your sleep will not be as recharging. Uh, At the end people of People don't realize actually chapter, the, the um, screen itself releases so much dopamine into the body that it actually prevents you from going back to sleep. Like the screen, I, I, for my own self, I don't use any. I don't have any screen time at all after six p.m. if I want to have a good night's sleep because that's how detrimental the, any screen is towards your sleep. Exactly, and again, the science is incontrovertible here. Yes, and you know another one you have in the wisdom chapter, which I think is incredibly important. And I think a lot of people forget it in their day to day lives. Is create a gratitude list. Uh, you know, list. You know, list the things you're grateful for. And what I always tell people is try to make it different each day, so that it's almost like a, yes. a gratitude muscle you have to exercise. And it's hard to find new things each day. I love that. Absolutely. It is a gratitude muscle. I'm going to quote you on that, too. Because <laughs> <laughs> like, cause like every day I could say, oh, I'm grateful for my two kids. But that's like the easy way out. Like it becomes yes. harder. I have to sweat that gratitude muscle if I have to think of things <laughs> other than my kids. Okay, I'm going on my gratitude list tonight, which I do every night. I'm going to say that doing this podcast with you goes on my gratitude list. That's excellent. I'll, I'll do that as well. <laughs> Because I really feel that that's how we reinforce the message for each other when we are with kindred spirits who um, approach the same themes with your own individuality and your own language, and we learn from each other. And that's why I think this journey um, is going to be so exciting in the years ahead because more and more people are are going to be um, – reinventing their lives and again small baby steps i want to stress that no big huge changes because they're often not lasting right well and i always I actually, mention you know sorry, in the story of the, in the story of the wizard of oz you know dorothy has no idea what's going to be at the end of the yellow brick road but she has to take that first step on the yellow brick road and that's how she begins her reinvention but you've you're like the master of reinvention like how many times in your life, would you say you've completely reinvented your career? You know, it's all happened in such an organic way that it's hard to see it that way. Because let's start with my book. This is my 14th book. But my books have been so different. So um, every book took me in a completely different direction, you know, from biographies to politics um, to how to live our best lives. Um but uh, the Huffington Post was definitely an entirely new career, which, um, which I entered in my 50s. So that's, I think that's what is so exciting, that there's no limit. We have a, a section at the Huffington Post called Half Post 50 that deals with life after 50. And, and that's a great time to, uh, to keep looking at all the things that we want to do differently in our lives. Well, and this, this also seems related to your wonder chapter where, you know, kind of always taking this childlike approach to the world so you do feel that sense of wonder. But specifically, you have an exercise here, forgive yourself for any judgments you're holding against yourself. And I think that's critically important as well. So many people spend so much time regretting things in the past that hurt them, but it's almost like they're hurting themselves twice. Because then they have they did the initial thing and that was the first arrow, but then they have the judgment against the initial thing and that's the second arrow and the second arrow is what could kill you. Well, and that's why one of the steps at the end of the wonder chapter is forgive yourself at the end of the day for any judgments you are holding against yourself and then forgive your judgments of others. And I say in the book, if Nelson Mandela can do it, you can too. And then, you know, really look at our life and the day ahead with newness and wonder. 
Yes, I think I think that's a good exercise. And again, it's an excellent book. I try to practice the exercises in this book. I highly recommend uh, people get it. It's Thrive by Arianna Huffington. And I'm so glad you could take the time to join us on my show. James, thank you so much. I look forward to staying in touch. Thank you. Definitely. Thanks, Arianna. For more from James, check out the James Altucher Show on the Stansberry Radio Network at stansberryradio.com and get yourself on the free insiders list today. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry, and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power, so how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash advance. That's oracle.com slash advance. oracle.com slash advance.